Good morning to uh, Singapore. Hopefully you can hear me okay. If those uh, who we're streaming into can't hear, wave your hand. Yes, no, no problem whatsoever. In the spirit of orchestration, as Professor Lee just noted, uh, I'd like to get some feedback. So on a zero to four scale, zero being I've never heard of the learning analytics and I'm actually in the wrong room and I'm trying to find my way out. Put your hand up. Excellent, we've got people who should be here. One is that uh, I'm interested in learning analytics but very much just getting started. A few. Two is that I've undertaken some analytics. Got some studies going, great. Three is I'm getting very good at analytics. <laughs> I can spell it. <laughs> yeah, we've got one who can spell learning analytics. <laughs> Excellent. We've got an editor for the final symposium. The, and four is I'm expert, and I'm here to criticise everything Dr. Dawson says. <laughs> the exit is that. <laughs> All right, we'll just ignore that part of the front. Excellent. All right, so I'll try and uh, shape the talk in, in line with that, but uh, I'd like to thank uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Jennifer Pebbing Ten, who I've known for a very long time, too long, uh, who's done a wonderful job to, to get this together, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to start off just very quickly, um, I was hoping Dragon was going to cover this aspect um, a little bit for me, but uh, we'll start off very quickly with a definition of learning analytics, just so we're on the same page. <coughs> I'll go through um, what I wanted to talk about was more around social network analysis and video analytics and some research that's uh, emerging there that we're very interested in. But I'll start off with a predictive example just to show, everyone loves a predictive example, just to show the use of the larger data sets before we get down into a more finer grain, grained uh, insights there. So I'll, I'll delve into SNA, uh, some video analytics and, and some very exciting stuff that um, Dr. Jason Lodge has been working on out of the Centre for Studies in Higher Education at the University of Melbourne. So um, we'll have a collaboration with him going forward over the next few years. So we all know that there's a changing higher education landscape and um, everyone has noted, I think there's more papers in education that start off that is education is in a state of flux, education is in, the storm, in a storm of change and so on. And yes, we're still in that storm of change and turbulence as we go forward. So we're seeing greater diversity of students entering a higher education. We're seeing a gentleman come up to tell me I haven't got something turned on. And that's much better. Okay. Hopefully that's much better. Okay, thank you. Um, and so we're seeing much greater student diversity, but at the same time, we're not seeing a huge amount of additional government investment here. So we need to make better use of our resources that we've got. And this is where Diana Ablinger from EduCourse has noted that uh, learning analytics is the potential game changer for education, or George Siemens, and thankfully he's not here today noted that th this is the most important movement over the last 100 years that would happen in education. And primarily arguing with George about that is because it touches on every system in education. Every system has an analytics component. So the definition that was brought about by some very, very intelligent people at the first uh, Learning Analytics Conference was that uh, Learning Analytics is the collection, collation, analysis and reporting of data about learners and their context for the purposes of understanding and optimising learning. Now, there's been a myriad of definitions that come out, have recently come out around learning analytics, just uh, slight nuances on that. But the most important aspect there is understanding and optimising learning. That's it. All right? We all collect data, we all do things about it. But I will state right now, learning analytics is not a grade at the end of your paper. Okay? Learning analytics is not saying that 70% uh, of the students pass this course. It's what you start to do with that data to actually understand and optimise the student learning in that focus. So primarily we've seen a lot of industry groups dive in and say, get answers to your most important questions like, how, easy, how can I easily find students at risk? And that's where learning analytics has emerged. And Purdue um, University with their uh, signals, course signals, was probably the, the dominant one that's really forged the market in, in shifting that forward, or the first ones. I'd like to just jump into a, a little example here. At Queensland University of Technology um, in Australia have, uh, have for a long time had a learning analytics uh, process involved as well. <coughs> Um, it was very successful, it focused on first year transitions, um, students entering a high, a, a university for the first time, but it also um, brought about uh, sort of Tinto's work in sort of that enculturation into the academic and social life. So there were a lot of aspects that, that worked around it. Essentially what the, the um, central units did was find students who failed to submit an assignment or failed an assignment, their very first assessment, then they would reach out and contact those students. And they report you know, a, great, a great success in retaining students and improving academic performance. 
So not surprisingly, this was a model because you don't want to replicate, you don't want to um, reinvent the wheel. So we wanted to replicate what they're doing and just shortcut, basically, or leapfrog is generally the term. So we adopted the QUT model at the University of South Australia, but we gave it a much better name. We called it ESAP, Enhancing Student Academic Potential, because it's important to badge these things. So we, uh, we set up a trained set of callers. We, um, we looked at the failure and non-submission of first assessment, exactly the same, and we focused a, as a trial on first-year courses that we know had a, a, either a large failure uh, rate or a, or a very high level of attrition. And it didn't work. <clears throat> so, no, nah, it's not a replicable model at all. Um, what we did note was that um, significant improvement in performance. So students we contacted, their final grade uh, was significantly higher than those students that we could not contact with, who were deemed at risk. So we improved their academic performance. But arguably, just because the students failed was probably enough of a kick and motivation to say, well, I really need to do better study anyway, was going to improve. So it's, it's very arguable that this process had any impact whatsoever. No. No improvement whatsoever in retention. And it was an important finding, because what it told us there was that context is critical. You can't just pick up a model from somewhere else and throw it into your institution and expect it to work. You've got to understand the context of your students. They were slightly different. The motivations are different. Our staff were different. The way that we taught was different. So a lot of other uh, factors there that actually influenced this process. So what did we do? So this was the first one where if we just broadly group our students from uh, high risk, so high risk of failure all the way through, um, or, or attrition, high risk of retention, so down to no risk. And these are the students, so you'll know there's some in your classes or courses that um, whatever barriers you put in front of students, they'll still pass. They're the, they're the, the ones that we, we love to have around, right? They're very easy, they're very competitive, they're very motivated and very self-driven. Then you've got your low risk students who probably need a little bit of support, hence the dotted line there. Our medium risk students, a little bit more support, and their high risk need a lot of support, hence the long dotted line. And what we found is that the support that we were giving when we were ringing up and saying, hey, can we help you? we noticed you failed your assignment, was actually too late for our high-risk students and even our medium-risk students. Right? We were trying to change their minds to stay at university rather than being a process by we were informing their decision-making process. We weren't giving them new information. They were saying, I am leaving the university, goodbye. It wasn't, I'm thinking about leaving the university. They already made up their mind. So it was a much more difficult process to go through. So clearly we needed uh, earlier interventions there. So we went through a CBA process. Um, and uh, to target student retention, not academic performance. Student retention is much more difficult because you actually have good students who leave. So this is the, what we ended up with. We had a set of demographics that we know, so we had a predictive model through our CBA process to say these are the types of students we think are at risk before they even start university with us. And that gave us an initial nudge point. Then we had, once they've started their course, so which was around engagement data now with our learning management system. And then, of course, we've got our final check here, which was on their assessment. So we had three touch points that we could start to work with our staff about, about uh, setting up strategies for, and learning interventions and support. Did it work? All right, so we had 11,000-odd students. Uh, around 2,000 were classified as academically at risk through the model. We attempted to contact all of them, but, of course, some kids don't pick up the phone. But my wife sometimes doesn't pick up the phone, so I can't hold it against them. Um, so we managed to get hold of 1,532, and we saw a 5.2% improvement on, on retention, which translates to around $2 million. And so it more than pays for itself. We spent less than $100,000 on the process. Right. The, now, you could argue again that, and, and my senior management group, very wise, um, said, OK, but the people who pick up the phone, of course, are more likely to stay. So what we did at the end was actually do a random sample where we just randomly selected the same risk students and called them again. And it was random. Students who didn't pick up the phone the first time picked up the phone the second time. Students who picked up the phone the first time didn't pick up the phone the second time. So we could see that those two populations we tested against were actually, yeah, they were random, no bias. But what was the trigger with the greatest impact? Because you've got demographic sets of data, you've got assessment data, and you've got course management data. And the most easiest one to pick up was course access. Now, within courses of varied, and Dragon Gasevich led a, a great paper around showing instructional conditions actually matter so much in learning analytics, and he's absolutely right. Um, but when you broaden it across the whole university, you can actually take a very crude approach. But it does it actually get to understanding and optimising learning? That's the critical question you want to ask yourselves. So the course access, it's easy, it's scalable, and it has great resonance with our teaching staff. And so we build a dashboard like this. 
And I would say that University of South Australia is probably one of the very, very few universities in the world where this goes across all aspects of courses. Every course has this. Every instructor is expected to use it. And as we roll into next year, there, it will be pulled into their academic, and academic reports. So if you're going through promotion and probation, this is an area where you can actually utilise that data to show how you're working with your students, improving your curriculum, um, having a, a more proactive approach in your design to enhance your uh, chances of getting through probation and promotion. But it's very easy to understand. You know, two students have never logged in. I'd better contact those students. Okay. Um, the, the offshoot of this was that in large classes, though, if you change that two to 200, uh, it created a whole lot of workload that staff were not happy with. Um, and so now we're working on a process, so how do we build this into our, our um, customer relationship tool, our CRM, so that staff can just literally cluster students into groups. I want to send this group of students a great email, they've improved their, their uh, engagement in the course. This group of students have never engaged, I'll send them my cranky email. Um, these groups of students, are, you know, they're, they're doing well, keep on track. And so you could cluster students around that, send out an email, and that would go automatically out to all the students. And again, you're writing five emails versus 200 emails, which is the process at the moment. Now, there's an important point to that as well, is when we roll this out, the institutions that are doing it well are adaptable and reflexive, and they respond to the conditions of their university and organisation. So if we came back and staff hated this, what would we do about it? So we needed to make sure it was flexible enough to change and adapt to what the requirements were for our staff. And the key point for them was make it easy to understand and make it workload efficient. And so now we're working on the second aspect there. So context is critical, critical or critical, depending on how you want to pronounce it. But the models are not easily transferable. <coughs> Adoption and integration is complex and you need to understand the, mo the models. And an important aspect there is staff training, which is one I didn't really touch on. Um, so what do these indicators actually tell me? So what do I do about them? And particularly when we're saying around the demographics, that if a, if a predictive variable there was distance from the university, so students are more likely not to come to lectures. I don't know whether to pose right now or not. It's quite, it's quite intrusive, isn't it? <laughs> okay, there we go. Anyway, so um, if distance from the university is one of the predictive variables, what, what can you do about that as an instructor? So besides building in flexibility, but that's already there, but if you want to have a blended learning model where students are coming on campus, how do you actually start to help students in that space? It makes it very, very difficult and it's hard for structures to understand it. That's why when it's course access, it's easy, it's easy to in interpret, it's easy to understand and it's something tangible that the instructors can do about. So staff training is very critical that we need to build on there. Phil Winnie talks about moving to an N of one. And this is where I jump in now. So we've gone from that big data, we'll just funnel it down into, into more fine-grained analysis here. Um, and I'll just jump in just in case people are not familiar. Social network analysis, this is what we call a, a sociogram where we have specific nodes, uh, linking edges or relationships between one node and another. And a node can be anything. So it could be an airport. So Changi Airport and you think of a network that evolves out of that. It could be a website, it could be a page on a website, it could be an activity in a website, or it could be people or students or teachers and so on. People who occupy this role, um, Ronald Burt would call them brokers, they broker information. So that if you took that node out, then you'd have uh, three separate clusters. So that's an important role. And if you're in an organisation, a central organisation unit like mine, you actually fill that brokering role quite a lot. You get a lot of information where one school has had a problem, you've set up an innovation or a trial or experiment to try and demonstrate that this would have impact, then how do you communicate that to the rest of the university? So central units or support units play critical roles in that and research uh, needs to play a far more critical role in that space as well when you think not only about other researchers but as you move this into community or into specific stakeholder groups. We have some centrality measures, so things like degree or in degree and out degree. This little camper here uh, has a degree of seven, which just means that they are in contact with uh, seven other nodes there. Seven other people. Have a, have a work with Kevin Baker's, six degrees of Kevin Baker. Um, this would be what we call a tight cluster, where there's strong ties. It's very indicative of strong, uh, of trust building or community development. So just moving in, so what's the importance of analytics, social network analysis into, uh, into education? 
Alexander Aston calls it the single most potent source of influence on a student's academic trajectory. It influences their performance, it influences their motivations, it influences the, their course progression, their academic retention, and the list goes on, their growth, their activities, even their co-curricular activities. Dragon, who's very, very good, I'll just leave it at that, Dragon is just very good, but he's very good at choosing titles, this was a great one, choose your classmates carefully, your GPA is at stake, who clearly demonstrated that uh, high-performing students go through with other high-performing students, but low-performing students also go with, through with other low-performing students. And this has been demonstrated through uh, Nicholas Christiakis's work as well around obesity. If you've seen that, the, the closer the tie you have to someone who is obese, the more likelihood that you will be obese. In fact, it was, uh, I think it was two times, uh, eight times likelihood. But as that, um, as that steps out a number of, uh, of nodes or levels, then the, the, the chance, the probability is far, far, far reduced. Um, and he also does it with happiness. So stick around with happy people, and you too will be happy. I hang around with only happy people. Life's bliss. All right, so from um, social network analysis, there wasn't a lot going on um, when we first started in this space, um, in, especially around the terms of, uh, in terms of visualizations of social networks that would, again, have meaning to academic staff. So we focused on a tool with a, a great colleague, Anisha Pakaria, um, <coughs> who's now at the University of Queensland. I apologise for the feedback there. But um, we developed this tool called Snap. And uh, for those who are actually aware of Snap, there will be a, a Moodle version. There's now a Canvas version, a Sakai version, and there will be a Moodle version coming out very shortly. Um, but what we want to do is focus on student relationships or the learning networks. We, we identified in the, in the use of learning management systems, there's really only two tools. You put up content or you get people to engage in a discussion forum. Everything else is pretty minimal when you look at it across a whole university. Yes, you have quizzes. Yes, you have chat or virtual classrooms. But they tend to be on the very, very small scale. So when we looked at it, it was less than 3% of, of staff in a university would make use of other tools. Everyone made use of the content page, and everyone made use of the discussion forum. So we wanted simple visualizations that would uh, assist with interpretation and evaluate how their impact of activities. We also had a lot of conversations around, I would like to have a sense of community in my classroom. But what does that look like? What does that mean? And how do you use a discussion forum to actually start to develop that? So we had this uh, lightweight analytics tool, a book, market, book marklet for a rapid and easy <coughs> dissemination. It took something like this. This is from the University of Wollongong in the Graduate School of Medicine. I believe we've got a medical theme going today. Yes, with Nabil, so I'll stick with medicine. So we took a, um, a medicine course here that looks a discussion forum, and we would make it look something like this. Now, that was far more interpretable than that. Okay, so each of these nodes, you would have a, I've been removed, but you'd have a student name or a teacher name. Anyone who was involved in that, you could clearly see who were the central players, who was interacting with who. You could actually select on a node and see who their ego networks were, which is great when you're trying to look to say, should I be worried about that student? Who are they hanging out with? And you take the work that Dragon's been doing, you'd say, well, oh, you've mixed them with high performers. That should be OK. This student, however, is getting a bit isolated. They're moving out of the network. But then they're starting to interact with other students who, are, who may be struggling with the course content. Just an example of the, again, just how the visualizations aid. Here's two forums, pretty much the same in terms of the number of posts that have been made. And then you get two different interpretations of the visualizations there. The one on the forum one, being dominated by uh, a main node there. Size of the node indicates the number of uh, posts they've probably made. But forum two, you've suddenly got three groups. Now think about it. If you had three groups actually set up in that discussion forum, you wanted them to work together to solve problems, you'd go, excellent, that's spot on. But if you're trying to develop up a sense of community and students to actually engage with one another, then you say, hang on, how do I actually connect those three groups? Because you could end up with three separate clusters morphing out. Here's a... Uh, it's just, it's just a big network, and so that's, I, got, I got really nothing more to say than that. It's just awesome. It should go on T-shirts. It's impressive. Uh, so here's a study where we took 1,000 a, a students in a, a, a large chemistry course at the University of British Columbia, and we looked at specifically at the ego networks of the top 10% performing students and the bottom 10% uh, students and had a look at who are they interacting with and how that works. And we saw with the, with the, um, the top... Is this a low? Uh, sorry, our low-performing student that largely they interact with the other low-performing students. Interesting thing was the student on the left there, uh, the top, who was a top percent, 10 percent. He was pretty much in all. He was, he was pretty awesome. He was in pretty much in all the networks, so it was great. 
But they, you can see that they're actually in a, it's almost this sort of uh, selection of who I interact with as they did. Because what, what information do you get from a discussion forum? It's the post. So actually interpreting the post and then selecting who they will respond to or not. Similarly, with the high performing students, the networks were much richer. And again, they, they are self selecting who they'll actually communicate with, which is an interesting process. But then we wanted to see what, what are the teaching staff doing in this? You know, with this information, what, what are they doing? We found that. Um, the staff interventions, they were in high, 70% of the high performing networks. The staff were located in 70% of the students in the high performing network, but they're only in 10% of the low performing networks. So we had a chat and said, and I don't like discussions, but I went and this is how far I'll go for research. I went and had a chat with these people and said, well, what's going on? And they, uh, they said, they're trying to build community. Right? So then they've been told, and I bet everyone who runs a discussion forum has been told in here, you don't need to jump in too fast, let your students actually respond. It builds community, students responding to one another, that's good socio-constructivist practices. So what they did was they said, oh yeah, these, have been, these posts have now been responded to, and they're very, very low level questions, they're definitional questions, or they're questions that were raised in, in the textbook that they could easily find. But the students were, trying, were really struggling with those definitions and what they actually mean to their work. So they were, they were actually replying to one another, but they're all struggling with the same problem and the instructors didn't actually go into actually qualitative thing then assess whether or not they needed intervention. In contrast, the high performers though, just the flagging of the questions and the posts they were making at the top showed it was a very conceptual question, much higher order thinking skills, right? So they're trying to bring in different problem areas and resolve things which require beyond the textbook, beyond the course level, so the instructors were jumping in and saying, okay, this is how you could start thinking about this and helping out more. Hence, they're in there a lot more. Okay, that's around performance, and it provided, as Professor Lee said, some feedback around the design and how we actually go around the operation, the feedback loops and so on, but can we only use network analysis for uh, academic performance? Well, you can, but there's certainly other uses of SNA, and we're moving much more rapidly around the use of text analysis to look at, and some work that Jen's been doing around creativity. In fact, the network down the bottom there where the, the nodes that are highlighted are all high brokering nodes relates to some work that we took off uh, Jen's uh, thesis, uh, and uh, looking at uh, sur um, a survey, can I call it a survey? An instrument to measure creativity uh, or cognitive playfulness was one of the key terms that we, we really liked there. So how can you actually build creative capacity pedagogies? And this was a way in which we could actually start to visualise that. Are the creatives in there the actual brokers? And that's Ronald Burt would talk about creative idea ideas being creative and how they actually morph through organisations and brokers, that people with high between the scores playing such a critical role. They take information from one group, they translate it, and they push it back to another group, so they're always seen as creative. That's why we're the teaching innovation unit. We actually don't do any innovation, we just take other people's ideas and translate them and push them on to others. But theoretically, around the uni, we look awesome. So, uh, no, so uh, they're key roles. But then, how do you actually get students to start to participate in that? Because you can't have everyone being, having a high between the score. So when does that come through, which then starts to talk about the longevity and how you actually transition from year one through to year three or year four and the development of graduate qualities and attributes that start to talk about creative thinking, creative problem solving, entrepreneurship, innovation. So where does that come through and how would we be able to demonstrate that? And this is one way in which we could uh, actually work on it. Sense of community, and that was uh, some interesting studies there on look, using network analysis to identify what would or what is a sense of community. Student satisfaction. You actually get a lot of information. Surprisingly, students who are isolated, I'm not sure if I had the isolated group in that one. Yes, you can see in the top left there, there's a group of nodes not connected to anyone. These would be your most dissatisfied students in, in the course, right? In, in, in probability speaking. Um, they've made a post, they've, they've reached out, but they haven't had a response from anyone. And so they're more dissatisfied than students who, they will rate the course low, more lowly than, um, at a lower level than students who don't participate at all. Okay. So again, it's a shortcut in ways in which we can actually start to get better insight. Dragon's team um, has been looking at social and cognitive presence, and, and in particular the use of text analysis and social network analysis. And obviously there's a big one around student retention and, and my unit's looking at what's the relationship between a, a student who leaves an organisation and their peers? What's the impact there on their immediate network group? And especially if a predictive variable is um, re, uh, distance from the university. And if you're a ride, if I'm catching a ride with Gen 10 into university and suddenly Gen leaves the university, 
that puts a lot of emphasis on me now. Do I, do I want to stay? My best friend's just left. How do I get to university? Who do I study with? So how do we integrate them more into a, a richer network so they have lots of uh, capital, academic and social, to support their learning? All right, I'd like to dive into to video analytics here very, very quickly because it's awesome. And uh, uh, video, as, as I'm you're sure you're well aware, it's, it's a huge, huge growth. Um, there's, there's rarely now uh, a textbook now that isn't a textbook. Imagine that. That actually has video in it. So all their online materials now, Pearson and so on, are publishing with simulations and video. Uh, you think of every MOOC you've ever taken, the general, the general design is video, quiz, video, quiz, video, quiz, assignment. Right? So it's in there in all our work. Um, we're increasingly capturing video such as this and making it a learning tool. Uh, we have tools like Echo360, which automatically capture um, all our instructors at, uh, at University of South Australia, all their lectures, which are put, on, put online within, I think, uh, 30 minutes. They're available for students to, to review. So it's not surprising we have three people in the audience so for, our, for our classes. We developed a tool at, um, it was called Class, but now it's got a better name uh, called Oval, Online Video Annotations for Learning. And essentially, you take a good looking guy like George Siemens, you ridicule him for a while, um, and then, then you offer money. But essentially, it was, we wrapped a video, and um, it allowed students then, as they watched the video, to make what we call point based annotations. So you could just select at a point in time, and it would appear on a timestamp like these two flags here saying something, something important there. The, the annotations then also had the capacity where you could actually add some text. So it might be a question. It might be, wow, that was a great resource, or George cracked another funny. The, um, who, who knows? It could be private. It could be shared. It was really up to the students to start making annotations. The idea was really around, what if we remove that video completely? And you're now using a, a tool, your computers, like most of you are, or, or your mobile device. And you can actually just say, that's, ooh, that's a good one. Ooh, that's a good one. And just make a point of it that you could now come back later and see, why did I actually make that as an important point to study? Or you could make some notes, and this become your note taking. And then you could share those notes with all the other students is where it developed from. So we're still working on that synchronization there, though. Regardless, what it did tell us is that there's lots of areas around convergence. So when you do say something funny, generally the most of the audience gets it, except for Dragon. But, the, but then he would be what we call divergent. So he's just outside the, the, the group. So we get people who converge and say, OK, this is probably the most important point of the lecture, and they'll make a, a, an annotation. But then you get people who sort of drift out and think other areas are. So it was a quick way then, if you've got large classes, to actually see the banding and what students do I actually want to just click on and see why they thought it was, and then get more detail about those students. Um, <clears throat> we then developed up a, uh, through a sort of self-regulated learning theory, uh, look, trying to improve students' judgment of learning. And so we actually had an area there where students could write a general summary of the video. Now, now tell me what the video was about, and you had to summarize it. And so then it would come back and tell you, okay, do you have these points? So we didn't want to tell the students straight away you did or did not have those points. We wanted them to go back and reflect on what they've written, what the video is about, and then see whether or not they actually changed. If they clicked no on all these, they didn't have the points. Do they then go back in and change their summaries? Yeah. <clears throat> so we also looked at the effect of external conditions again with um, Dragon. This is going to, you're a common theme here. Lucky you're the last person to speak today. You bring it all home like Michael Phelps. Right? And so we had a look at the assessment of, of student self-reflection. So there was a um, music course, and we looked at the external conditions being an assessment process on the music course. So in course one, students used the uh, oval tool. They had their conducting performance uh, videoed. They then uh, reviewed that video and made a series of self-reflections on that, a summary around that. In the course one, it was not graded. In course two, it was graded. And then we saw that in a naturalistic setting <laughs> that uh, students migrate from course one over to another non-graded one, or they might go from course graded to graded or graded to non-graded and so on. So we had this nice mix of students going through and seeing what happened. So what happened? Oh, sorry. We also, um, for the analysis of the, of the summaries, we also did a LOOC analysis, Linguistic Inquiry Word Count. This is a fantastic tool. Looking, and then uh, we found that and counts of annotations. And we found that for the graded was obviously more than non-graded. So if you actually start off with a graded assessment and part of the grades are allocated to the students being doing self-reflections uh, and summaries there, 
Clearly, they will use it more. It's a great finding. Took two years of hard scale research, digging deep in there, but we found assessment actually impacts on students. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, okay. what we found then, um, but what if you go graded to non-graded? All right, so what if they change? And what we found then in that one is that um, student, five minutes, you change that sign, young lady, right now. <laughs> You've picked up the wrong one. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what if they go from graded to non-graded uh, in that process? And we found that students, when they do go from graded up to, uh, say, course two to course four to a non-grade, they actually maintain the same level of annotations, the same quality of annotations as they go through. So the way that they use and start to think about using a particular learning tool to enhance their, their learning processes, they maintain that through, even though it's no longer an assessable component. Okay? And if you take students from the non-assessed straight into an assessed, then obviously they ramp it up. Students who go from a graded to a graded maintain the quality all the way through. So once they've learned a tool, once you've given them a, a set of scaffolds to understand how a tool can enhance their learning process, they will continue and use that, that tool there. I'll just jump into, this is some work with uh, Abelardo Pardo in the University of Sydney where we actually did the same process then, looking at his blended learning class, but went through a set of clusters and looked at how students then use it from minimalist all the way through to highly engaged and can't get enough of things. All right, and that wasn't just the, the video annotation tool, that was now looking at right across his blended learning, his blended learning design. And what we found is that you can actually identify specific learning strategies. Now the key there, if you know a student's learning strategy, all right, they're poorly engaged, they go a certain pathway, they might dive in and look at the assessment, then maybe do a discussion forum post or look at the assessment, try the quizzes and then review the video. You can actually start to modify and customise your feedback because you know they haven't seen the video yet, yet they actually just tried an attempt on the quizzes. Now that'd be very different feedback to someone who just watched the video and then went and did the quizzes. So we can start to customise and think about it. But then if you actually understand what's the value that each of those questions brings to their final academic performance, you can go even better. I got 9 out of 10, but I got the critical question wrong. All right, so you'd still want me to go back and, and try and revise that question, So because it's a threshold concept that might carry through into into later years or later components of the, of, the, of the program. Carolyn, she got nine out of 10, but it was a different one wrong, and she might get, well done. Because the first question was, you know, why are you here in this course? And she put, I'm here to get a medical degree, and no one wants that. So they tagged no. The last part is uh, learning can be confusing. And this is a critical element of how it now starts to relate around <coughs> student satisfaction versus academic performance. In Australia, we have every 15 minutes we're evaluating students' responses, and Jen's done the same thing. Give us your feedback on how the symposium went. But we're continually evaluating, you know, are you, know, are you happy with the course? You know, are you engaged? Are, you, are there elements we could improve? Are we doing all these sorts of other things? We did a, a, a view of video. This is specifically just looking at a video and how students respond to it, both in terms of knowledge and also in terms of their satisfaction. All right? How mentally challenging is it? The control one was just a PowerPoint and conversation, taking students through a concept for about eight minutes. Um, the tablet was using, uh, again, same one, um, a voice over, but then now it was drawing, similar to the Khan Academy style videos that I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, teaching calculus, they sit there and they start, they start drawing out. The Socratic one was the same as the tablet, except they had another researcher typing in and asking questions that they thought might be misconceptions, the areas that students might not get. And so we saw what happened there. And you can see that with the Socratic one, that style of video, you see a huge increase in, in student performance and the <coughs> in, an improvement on their post-test, which is not any different to the work that Derek, Derek Muller has done out of University of Sydney. And I encourage you to look at his work around misconceptions as well. But then, interestingly, Jason uh, and his colleagues asked them, okay, was it organised, the clarity, the engaging, the, you know, did, what did you learn, your satisfaction? And it's actually reversed. And so if you're asking students, is this a good learning resource, in all, if they're saying yes, panic, right? It's probably not. Learning is confusing. And if you're confused, you're not necessarily happy. Right? So it's an important concept to start to bring through. One minute. You're a harsh lady. Um, thankfully, I'm wrapping up. Um, <laughs> all right, so we've got this huge focus now um, from large areas down, large data down to small, fine-grained data that we can start to look at. SNA and video in particular are really growing in education and their adoption. Video, we just do not know enough about. 
Not at all. The way that we're presenting video, we're going on an assumption. Who said seven to eight minutes was all we can watch? You know, you watch two hours in a David Attenborough without flinching. Right? So why is it seven to eight minutes is all we can hold? There's a lot more research we need to do in just how we present information through that medium. Uh, we also want to look at um, the role of annotations and, and review in learning. What if you make annotations versus you don't make annotations in a tool like Oval? Does it aid recall? What types of knowledge does it actually produce by going through that process? And the last thing is looking at, now we've got very easy capacity around wearables, um, you know, the, what are the Empatica bands or watches, to actually get um, skin conductance or arousal rates. So you can actually see when students are stimulated and does that actually relate to when they might actually make an annotation or what their recall might be quite high at. The last part, um, I'd just like to reiterate, there are very, very few wide-scale institutional examples of learning analytics embedded across the world. Very, very few. Learning analytics is complex. It's not an easy thing to roll out across an organisation, but lots, that's why we have such huge amounts of research at the moment being undertaken, but it's on a course or a program because they're owned by an individual instructor. To try and get whole of institutional data and then to roll out a whole of institutional platform is very, very complex. Data alone does not change behaviour. Right? Telling students they need to study more does not improve. Uh, you need to access your learning management system more. To do what? Right? Tell me something more instructive. The feedback has to be more personal and, and um, motivating for the student, personally relevant. It doesn't actually change organisational capacity either. By presenting things to, to staff and saying, look, your course is poor or your course is doing well, doesn't get an immediate response. We need to actually provide a lot of training on how we build an understanding around analytics capacity right across an organisation. And don't forget that we've all focused, big data is great. It's fun to play with, it's huge, the numbers, but everything is, is uh, predictive in big data. It's when you get down into the fine grain as well that you can actually reveal really important insights into student learning. We need to develop more tools that aid instructors in being able to get to those, those learning insights. Thank you. How did I go? Q&A. I believe we have 10 minutes for Q&A. Oh, I had 10 more minutes. Yes, you did. <coughs> we have uh, 7 minutes after you say that. But yeah, anyone? Um, yeah, please feel free. Um, I'm a member of Group 4. <laughs> Sorry, you're right. I'm a member of Group 4. <coughs> oh, she's there. I'm from the beginning. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> 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 is this a Singaporean thing I just don't have it? Yeah. So, um, <coughs> what strikes me is that the content of the presentation has not, in any deep sense, connected with the core idea of learning analytics. It seems to be about learner management. No, uh, that's right. at least you raised that question. So I'd say, what are we doing about it? Which, you know, given the short amount of time, it's very hard to, to nip into. But I'll, I'll nip into areas such as this. This is the work where I did just gloss over because I did. Most people are not in group four. Right? So this is uh, looking at how student pathways start to go through that learning, um, that online video tool. Right. So most of the offshoots of data we get are going to be through some form of technology or another. Right? So this is then taking and saying, well, in that tool, if we make every event you can do on that site uh, a part of the network, then what pathways do they go through? And so again, you can actually get density graphs and information there available for every single individual student, which then again, you can personalise and start to adapt. So if you've got a model then that says, okay, Shane's a, he's, he's a, I wanted to get a credit in my course, okay? So now I've got not only my motivation for being in the course and the grade that I'm aiming for, I've now got a trajectory to say, okay, what are students like Shane? How have they trajected through that course to get a credit? And now I can actually start to intervene and, and say, okay, Shane, you're not, you're on, you're on a fail. Right? Here's how I would nudge you now into further spaces there. Here's how I would start to connect into different areas. Sure, but that's not about learning. What is it about? So you actually... It, it, was, it was doing wrestles with certain difficult yeah. concepts. How does this connect with learning analytics? That's what I'd like to know. Well, then you know. So, if, are they scrubbing behaviour? What's learning? <laughs> we can't get to a definition of learning. I mean, we've got exactly. very exactly. Okay. Yes. So we've got very crude measures at the moment, which generally relate to an academic performance, which is generally related to a quiz or some form of knowledge recall or a skills demonstration or some other aspect. 
I mean, it may not. I mean, there's lots of argument. I mean, we could get into a very deep philosophical argument then around the point of assessment at particular points in time when they may have demonstrated things earlier. So I think that what is it that you're actually looking for that would actually start to demonstrate recall? The process and behaviour that they do is that we're nudging students into a behaviour that is probably more aligned to achieving those skills and demonstration of learning that you would get to. Sure, but recall is superficial. <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily have to be recall. Well, what's really difficult is meaning making. Yes, it is. And, and how does learning analytics make connection to that? Mm -hmm. Good question. I'll take it out with you after that. Okay. Yeah. Steve, I'd like to follow up your, uh, I don't know what group I'm in, um, probably on the outside for sure. <laughs> okay, I'd like to follow up with your comment on annotation uh, being graded and the implication that, um, I don't know whether the inference is this is first cause, yeah. and that afterwards, because I have gone through that, I will then uh, naturally continue the process. Um, are you implying that it's first cause? Um, I, I, I mean, nothing's causal, is it? It's an, it's, for me, everything's an indicator which taps into this general. If you can define what learning's going to be, then we'll find indicators that actually demonstrate that there is learning. But then there's learning, it's ephemeral. I mean, it's, it's very hard I think to it's find. great. Okay, I'm not so, criticizing. I'm just no, no, wondering so, if, if, if. So, yeah. no, I'm not indicating that uh, if you actually. Just because you use the tool that you would actually be a higher performing student then you would have a longer term. What, we're, what we are indicating is that students who, um, the, the, the role of assessment in that process provided sufficient scaffold for students to at least have motivation to maintain that in, in their future courses, whether they'll grade it or not grade it. Okay, I like the, the scaffold uh, concept. And one other question that I had was related to, and it's something I've been struggling with, when I was a student in university, and I'm paying my way, I'll make the decision as to whether I want to be involved or not, okay? And I think we're moving into a really uh, intrusive area and as we start to monitor uh, to, you know, to intrinsically. I'm more interested in the monitoring related to presentation of content and uh, the value of that content and using the analytics to, you know, you know to, to provide insights around that. I'm not interested that you track where I am, and you know, when I'm in, and what I'm doing. And I, I don't know how we're gonna, you know, differentiate that. And I would I invite all of you here to reflect on, if that same kind of analytics were applied to you and I, every day in what we do, how would we feel? So, I mean, I think these are tensions that we, yeah, you're right. It's a friction of where the privacy and ethics and how students actually engage in it. So one of the things, I'm yet to see a very good dashboard that presents information back to students. I haven't seen one yet that really does it in a manner that <coughs> promotes learning or demonstrates learning. The simplest one I'll reflect on and say, uh, how many of you have a, a pedometer or a Fitbit or Nike shoes or run or whatever else? And it's the same same message, it's just very simplistic. If you want to you set a goal, I want to run five kilometers, I want to do it in 20 minutes. And you chart and get information there to try and guide you in that process. So I think, yes, there are tensions around what are we giving to students and what are we not giving to them. I think one of the key things that comes out for me at, at a whole of institution, not an individual, right, so at a whole of the institution, is how we actually improve what we, that course content and delivery that is actually more personalised. And uh, can you actually start to use this information to break up? Okay, you, you don't want to be involved. Okay, that's fine. So why? You know, what, the message should come back then. Are you travelling okay? If you are, then why would I intervene? And if I've got a, a knowledge and history of your study patterns and behaviour, why would I intervene? On the other hand, I might have students there, and are we ethically obliged then that, and we have, I'm very confident other people have them in their organisation as well, students who come in with all the best intentions, we charge them a fee, and then for no fault of their own, they get busy, they forget to unenroll, and they're there for 12 weeks of the course, and realistically, there's no chance of uh, passing. We have students that we can identify at six weeks with over 90% um, accuracy on whether or not they'll pass or fail the course. So why do we take them through the remaining seven weeks of the course? I mean, do we have a moral obligation then to say, actually, can, how do we restructure this program so it better suits these students so they have a better opportunity to pass? I think that's valuable. But you're absolutely right. There are many tensions in this space that we still need to grapple with.
Actually, can I just request, oh hi, please, can we just request that you uh, maybe introduce yourself um, very briefly where you're from because we're multi-institutional, so we have a better context for the questions and where they're coming from and we can all learn together, that would be really great. So I shall start, um, Victor, I'm from uh, the Ministry of Education, Technologies for Learning branch. Now, uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. I'm interested also in terms of the layer of um, data that uh, informs the visualization. So for instance, when you talk about um, student relationship in, uh, and, and how that affects the, the kind of um, um, learning that they have, underneath that um, student relationship is that layer of uh, what you call learning interaction. But uh, when we talk about what this learning interaction really means, we are looking at um, I was wondering how you met that. I, I was thinking what, whether it was just about just responding to um, to threats in forums, and if that um, is sufficient for us to say that that is learning interaction, and by by by, by that we are saying that um, that is an indicator of the kind of relationship they have with one another. Of course, we also have that context uh, where we know that a lot of the learning interaction takes place uh, offline rather than online. So how would that? Um, in a sense, skew the interpretation of the data and, in a sense, affect the visualization that we see. Yeah, that's a great question. So, I think it tapped into that area I mentioned before <coughs> around the uh, Dragon's work with us on uh, instructional conditions. And so, in the ESAP program that I mentioned, um, I'll just touch on that before I get into the relation. But you just saw the diversity of the way that people actually use the learning management system, but then whether or not, say, course access alone would be a, an indicator. Okay, so, but. Again, when you're working right across a whole institution, it does map out that course access is one. But when you get down into the nuanced area of the way that people actually teach the course and the way they design the course, it could be completely different. So we have one course there that didn't use the learning management system. It was just a portal into other social media activities. So they used Twitter and they used Facebook. Okay? So then what, can, what data could we extract from that? We could, we could look at as well. In terms of the social network relationships that we developed here, it was through discussion forum activity. So it was web, you made a post, Great, you're in, and you made a reply to that post, and that formed a relationship. So it's as simple as that. And so that was the primary area where, they, the, given the design of the course, the students start to unpack the key concept of the course. So it was a key area where you could actually identify areas. There's a lot more insights that we could we could have undertaken. So qualitatively, could we have gone through all the all the posts and start to map them out? Could we have clustered in different ways? Could we have taken um, looked at brokering models and um, the different topic modelling and interactions, and there's great research now uh, moving in that with MOOCs. Um, I think Carolyn will probably touch on one, especially in relation to confusion. No, it doesn't capture everything, not, a, not even close. And it's a, a very, very thin slice of their life of what happens. But again, um, unless we're going to have cameras everywhere and start to analyse and who did you speak to on a given day, well, this is what we're going to have to do, which means that there's a lot of fuzziness around it, which probably touched into the gentleman's comment there. There is a lot of fun. It's not definitive, it's not causal. For me, that they're indicators of, what, of things that we can look at to improve or things that we can actually start to provide students. If we go back, take the, all this data away. Take it all away. Go back to when you sat in a class. Students were in class and they were in class. What indications did you actually get there? You were reliant every single time on a teacher who could make a personal connection with the instructor, right? Who would then say, this student's good or this student's bad. Now, if your experience at university was anything like mine, I have people come in and start to draw benzene rings on a board like this. Now, unless they had very, very good reflective glasses to see whether or not we were paying attention or whatever else, which I sincerely doubt, they had no idea. Of 500 students in the classroom, they're all, you know, madly copying benzene rings with no idea what they meant. But I hope later on that we would have a conversation about, so where's the personalisation, where's the feedback, where's the opportunity there? And you, and you wonder why. I think in that cohort in Australia was one of the first ones where the government took the, the caps off. And we had went from something like 300 students to 800 students. And you had teachers there, obviously, you didn't want to uh, that many in there. So you had massive failure rates, absolutely massive. Because you had a, a design process, a teaching model that just didn't even capture. At least in this way, we're getting not accurate, not, it's not 100%. And we're not infallible, and there's lots of fuzziness, and there's lots of tensions, and lots of areas we still need to work through. But at least we're getting a little bit more insight around student behaviours and student, student patterns of study and educational stuff. Like that. And with that, time is up uh, for this uh, time of Q&A, but we will again have a long panel for discussion at least an hour after, um, after the meeting. So will you please put your hands together and just thank you.